Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Dr. Thomas Hemingway here. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss out. Today we have a very special guest. I'm so excited for this interview with Dr. Zoe Harcomb. She's coming to us from Wales, which is across the globe from where I am. And what a pleasure to be with her today. Welcome, Zoe. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, what a pleasure. What a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for being here. I'd love it if you just uh, started a little bit with your background, kind of how you got to the space, what, uh, what brought you here, a little bit about your journey, and we'll just go from there. Crikey, that could uh, fill the slot, couldn't it? So I'll be, I'll be quite <laughs> brief. Um, I did maths and economics at Cambridge, so I'm a bit of a numbers nerd. Um, then had what my mother would call a proper career. So I did management consultancy. I worked in big food. I worked in big pharma. So I've seen those two from the inside. And then about the time of the financial crash around 2008, 2009, I got the opportunity to leave the corporate world and do what I really enjoy doing, which is um, looking more at diet and health. So um, I then did a PhD in 2012, and that was defended in March uh, 2016. And that was in, as you've said in the intro, the dietary fat guidelines, and were they evidence-based? But for about the last 10, nearly 11 years now, um, I've basically been dissecting academic articles. So that's become sort of what I've become known for among people who are interested in that kind of stuff. So when you see the headlines saying red meat causes cancer or whole grains are gonna save your life, um, I go and look at the academic literature so that you don't have to. Um, and I'll basically do a 2000, 3000 max word summary on why you shouldn't worry about this latest nonsense that's come out. Um, so essentially, if people say to me at a dinner party, what do you do? I say, I read, write and talk about diet and health. That's kind of me. <laughs> well, that's amazing. It's, it, I think it's very interesting that you got your start with sort of the big food, big pharma. Now you're really, you know, just making your focus on getting down to the actual data. What does it show? Because I'm sure you can tell us, but there's lots of, uh, I hate to, you know, be controversial, but a lot of the data that's out there is um, not exactly, you know, the spin is so different than what the data actually shows, yeah. you know, that there's a lot of bias in there that, uh, I'm sure you'll talk about at some point, but how, how did you make that transition from that? That's quite an almost dichotomous transition from going from working in that sort of corporate world to deciding that you want to really, you know, pick it apart and, and, and so on. Was there some kind of health struggle that you had or was there some other interest that got you? What, what really was the pivot for you? Because they seem very different. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question, because there was a, a kind of a second world for me going on in parallel that was always there. Um, and I was just fascinated by obesity. So when I was at Cambridge, um, it was kind of, um, I mean, the dietary guidelines had been coming in in the US for over 10 years, but I guess they were just sort of filtering through a little bit more into the UK and people were talking about having low fat spreads and don't have butter. And it was long before it got into the sort of, you know, red meat is bad for you kind of madness, but just um, diet drinks started coming out and, and people were sort of more interested in crisp spreads and um, weird products were, were coming out. And I just remember being completely fascinated by obesity and it was starting to take off um, but nobody wants to be obese. And then by the end of the last century, um, even more so, you know, I'd never met anybody who wanted to be obese. And yet by that time, over 25% of men and women in the UK were obese in America and Canada, it was even higher. Um, and so I, it, it became like a mathematical problem. You know, what changed? Why did we go from in the UK, it was about 2.7% obesity for both men and women in 1972. Why did we go from that to this, you know, at least uh, a quarter heading on for a third? And it just didn't make sense. And you look at all the standard arguments of, um, you know, the greed sloth, people just ate too much and they did too little. Um, and, and the numbers just didn't say that. So when you go and look at the data um, and, and data, particularly in the UK for calorie intake, calorie intake actually went down during that period. And we can argue about how accurate that is and do, do people just not remember um, accurately what they ate. You can debate all of that thing, but there really wasn't a clear trajectory of people got fatter and people ate more or people did less. And in terms of the doing less, it was actually the opposite. You know, when I was 
a kid growing up and maybe we were kicking around on a street corner with roller skates on or playing hopscotch nobody ever ran past with a jogging suit on and nobody ever cycled <laughs> past with all that lycra on um people did sports my parents did sports they played hockey they played squash they played badminton they played tennis they didn't go jogging they didn't go running or cycling you know, all of that just hadn't started there was no aerobics there was no jane fonda um it it just didn't it didn't make sense nothing added up so i wanted to try to understand what else might have changed because it wasn't that we ate more and did less um, and of course one of the things that did change was that we changed our dietary guidelines so we changed what we ate rather than how much we ate and i think that has had a significant impact yeah no that's so fascinating it brings back some memories for me as well because as kids I didn't ever remember seeing anybody jogging in the neighborhood either or bicycling. You know, now I just dropped my daughter off to school this morning and there were several people heading up the road on their bicycles with all of the Lycra, exactly how you said it. <laughs> and I never saw that as a kid. Now, I can't even think of one incident. In fact, I had a bicycle that I rode to and from school and to basketball practice. And I was always the only cycle on the entire road that was going a long distance. We would tool around in our, in our sort of cul-de-sac as kids and with our bikes and make jumps and things like that. But nobody purposely would ride bikes for miles and miles and miles. It was, it was very different. So I, I find that fascinating. And I think the, the numbers could be a little bit different in the UK, but I, with respect to the amount of uh, uh, calories people were eating or, or, or whatnot that you mentioned, but I think the biggest change is what you said is the dietary guidelines came out and we were started to be recommended to eat a certain way. And then all of these crazy foods yeah. came out that had highly processed things in them. And we'll, we'll get to that. But what, um, what do you think was the impetus behind from your research? And you, I know you can speak both to the UK guidelines as well as the US uh, guidelines. What, what was the biggest impetus behind putting out those guidelines in the first place? Do you think what's the background there? Yeah, um, I mean, I looked at that for my PhD because you have to do that in the introduction. You have to set the background. Um, and it was very much the Senator McGovern Committee of 1977 that came out with dietary goals for the US. And then they got embedded in the dietary guidelines, which, of course, come out every five years, starting in 1980. And from piecing things together and, and some some people have sort of written lay literature on this, um, you know, uh, Nina Teicholz covers it. In big fat surprise i think denise minger covers it in her look at the food pyramid as well um but at the time the the committee had been tasked with looking at under eating and looking at malnutrition and where people weren't getting nutrients and i guess like any government committee um you know they they've got their egos they've got their remit but they always want to overextend their reach and their remit so for some reason they then just started looking at the whole diet um, and the story goes that um, McGovern particularly, personally, had been very recently on a Pritikin boot camp, which was a very low fat um, and, of course, accompanying, you know, concomitantly a high carb. If it's low fat, it's high carb. Um, that's the only be, two right? things. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah, people, people sort of don't get that. But protein is pretty constant. If you drop fat, carb goes up as a proportion and vice versa. So he'd been on this very low fat, high carb literally before going over to sort of preside over this committee that started to look at general guidelines for the US. So he was getting lots of submissions from professors and from doctors and dietitians and dietary experts. Um, and Robert Olson, uh, Dr. Robert Olson was one of them saying, you know, I'm pleading with you here now and I'll plead with you again. Um, please don't go and change the diet for the whole of the US when we just don't have evidence on what the impact will be. Um, and his kind of McGovern's kind of response was, oh, you know, you doctors, you've got all the time, you researchers, you've got all the time in the world. You know, us politicians, we don't. We need to sort of do something. Um, so there just seemed to have been this impetus to do something. I'm going to make my mark on the world kind of attitude. And boy, did someone make their mark on the world. Um, and then personal influence of having tried this low fat, high carb um, diet. And that was very much in his frame of mind. Um, there was a vegetarian, um, Hegstead, Mark Hegstead was very influential. In fact, I believe he was the one who actually wrote up the guidelines. Um, so he's in the single biggest position of influence. Um, just things came together uh, like this sort of perfect storm of 
bias and influence and personal opinion. Uh, it certainly wasn't evidence based or academic research that, that gave us these new guidelines because there is no evidence base. That's what my PhD looked at. Yeah, well, I, I think that's the part that many people have no clue about. They have no understanding that these guidelines, when they came out, they certainly were not, were not evidence based. And we, we like to, I think, pride ourselves as you know, a society, especially where I came from, sort of a Western medicine trained doctor, we always talk about evidence based. And, and then the very thing that we're using to kind of direct people how to eat was not evidence based. Like, I don't think it, most people have any clue to that. And the problem is, as you know, once you start this sort of snowball, it's really hard to stop it because each year or every five or so years that they come out with a new one, it's really hard to make changes. And the changes, there, there have been a little, but very, very little. I mean, if you still look at the most recent guidelines and the saturated fat that's recommended, it really hasn't changed much, if at all, very little. And so it's, <laughs> the train has left the station and somehow we got we to gotta correct that. And so um, yeah, we, we, we need to mention the other conflicts as well, of course, because the guidelines have always favored the processed food companies. So if you're demonizing things like eggs, um, you know, stupidly because of cholesterol content or fat content or whatever, what do people then have for breakfast instead? They have cereals. And of course, um, you know, if you look at the work of Belinda Fetke, for example, um, in Australia, she's traced right back through to the Seventh-day Adventists, um, the emergence of Graham's um, cereal companies, General Mills, Kellogg's, Harvey um, Kellogg and so on, the, the, the conflicts that have been there for over a hundred years, driving us to eat these sort of whole grains and cereals rather than the natural foods that the world provides for us. And when you get those guidelines that come out in favor of those big companies, they're never gonna let them go. So they're gonna make sure that they're putting all of these sort of health claims on their packaging um, to get people to eat their stuff. And just every time the guidelines come out, they'll re-lobby, make sure that they stay um, yogurt companies want full, um, you know, they, they, they want the low fat yogurt with the high sugar rather than the full fat yogurt. It's, it's just, it's been perpetuated by people who've, who've got a, a benefit for, for keeping all of these going. The people who don't benefit are the poor sods who then go and eat the way that they're telling us to yeah. eat. Do you ever get tired of planning, prepping and cooking your own healthy meals? Well, I know I do. And so you've got to check out Trifecta Nutrition. They ship pre-made high quality with great ingredient meals right to your door. From paleo to keto to vegan and so much more, they have delicious meals for every diet. You gotta go over there to trifectanutrition.com and check out the code Dr. Thomas, D-R-T-H-O-M-A-S for 40% off at checkout. So trifectanutrition.com and use the code D-R-T-H-O-M-A-S at checkout and get yourself 40% off. I hope you'll enjoy it as I do. Aloha. Yeah, no, couldn't couldn't be more. Oh my gosh, so, so true. And yet, I think many have no idea of that. And you, you and I, I think both grew up in that era where it was like we couldn't, you know, eat eggs without being either demonized or somebody was worried we would. My mother, in fact, she still thinks that when I eat, you know, several eggs for breakfast in the morning, she thinks I'm going to have a heart attack. And I said, Mom, don't worry about it. That stuff is not. Been, been shown to be true. I love eggs. They're probably, in my humble opinion, one of the original superfoods. Like, mm. it's crazy that we call all these other things superfoods that are, are not superfoods. They're full of carbohydrates, they, you know, whatever. But, but an egg is a true animal, you know, protein and cholesterol source that our body recognizes. We have the same types and sequences of those proteins and amino acids. And, and also, of course, the cholesterol that exists there in our brain, as we know, is mostly cholesterol and fat. If we don't get those natural sources, our body's going to have to figure out how to make that up from other, you know, substrate. And so why not get the natural sources? How did we go wrong? Let's just, let's just go to the, you know, cholesterol and the saturated fat argument. How did we go wrong there? Oh, crikey. <laughs> I mean, we, we That's went a big wrong. One, I know. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and do that one quickly as well. I mean, we went wrong on that one back as far as the 1900s. So um, some Russian, I mean, we didn't even really have the term heart attack until about 1948. But in the very early 1900s over in Russia, 
some pathologists, um, geez, that's the <laughs> biggest glass of water I think I've ever seen. I've got my little, little beaker here. But anyway, some pathologists <laughs> um, noticed that where people had died suddenly um, and they, they were doing autopsies and they noticed um, sort of blockages, I guess, in the arteries and they were trying to hypothesize, was that why the person had died suddenly? So they would investigate those blockages in the arteries more carefully and they would find that they c contained fatty substances, um, lipids essentially. And of course, one of those lipids would be um, cholesterol. Um, but one of the best analogies that I've heard for that is it's like saying when you see a firefighter at the scene of a fire, you're accusing the firefighter of being the one who set the fire. No, they turned up to repair the damage, um, which is exactly what cholesterol is doing. So if you've got arterial damage, damage to the endothelial wall, um, something else has caused that damage in the first place and back at that era it was very and particularly in Russia it would be very likely smoking stress pollution um, poor diet lifestyle all those kinds of things and then of course lipoproteins travel around the body with all the great substances that they carry phospholipids protein cholesterol triglycerides to go to those areas of damage to repair them um, but the pathologist saw this cholesterol and, and developed this association um enter sort of Ansel Keys around the 1940s, 1950s. He's a, he'd of course done the Minnesota starvation experiment around 1945. So he was sort of the man of the moment. So then he wanted to turn his attention to heart disease and try to solve um, what was then emerging as American men, particularly middle-aged men, seemed to be dying prematurely and it seemed to be heart-related. So he picked up this research from earlier on in that century and said, oh, it's got to be cholesterol. And he actually investigated, not many people know this, you know, he investigated randomized controlled trials, population studies. He, he investigated all potential evidence for did dietary cholesterol cause a problem, did blood cholesterol cause a problem, and he just couldn't find a problem with either of those. So he then kind of rehypothesized and said, well, I think it's dietary fat. And then, of course, he came up with that famous chart where he said, oh, I think here's the association between dietary fat in particular countries and heart disease in men in those countries, but left out a lot of countries that wouldn't fit with his hypothesis. And then he went ahead and did the seven country study on the back of that graph um, and then try to claim at the end of it. Oh, I think there's, so he went into the seven country study thinking there's a relationship between fat generally, dietary fat and heart disease and didn't find one. So then he said, well, I think it's saturated fat and heart disease, but saturated fat to him included things like cakes and ice cream um, because they were sources of saturated fat, but far more importantly, they're, in, they're sources of sugar and carbohydrates. So, you know, you're, as we do nowadays, we still say, oh, you know, burgers and buns and ice cream and cookies and cakes and pizza and damn that in the name of saturated fat when you should really be damning it in the name of carbohydrate and processed food and all the other things. So we've just kept all these um, nutritional inaccuracies, these errors going for now 70 years. Um, and people just don't seem in any hurry to correct them because it's very beneficial for the fake food companies to damn saturated fat and then try to take out saturated fat and stick in polyunsaturated fats because they're cheaper and easier to process. They just happen to be absolutely terrible for human beings. Yeah, one thing I hope you'll just uh, <clears throat> clarify for our listeners, because I'm not sure that we're all as great as statisticians as you are, but you mentioned something really important in, in that about the association. And I think what many of us don't realize is most of these studies that look at nutrition and, and things like that are not the sort of gold standard randomized control mm -hmm. trial type of study. There are some of those, but those are very few. And most mm -hmm. of the studies that are quoted throughout the world, whether it be by whatever groups of people that want to promote their diet uh, to others, typically they use studies that show association, not causation. Maybe you could just briefly explain what those two mean and the types of studies that look at that, just so we can kind of get a bigger picture of, of what those terms mean. Yeah, I mean, it, it's probably um, one of the biggest flaws of population studies, also known as epidemiological studies. So all that they can establish is an association. So they can take something like Framingham. So they'd have taken the town of Framingham and they've signed up, you know, thousands of people. And then they take all their measurements in terms of sex, age, 
BMI and then ask them loads of questions like how often do you exercise and what typical diet do you eat and they've got to try to remember what they ate last year and that's another inaccuracy but they then observe them over a, a period of time and then they they can make valid observations like oh my goodness of the smokers people who smoke were then 20 times let's say more likely to go and develop lung cancer now when you get that kind of strength of association 20 times or i think in in the original one it was chimney sweeps were 200 times more likely to get scrotal cancer than men who weren't chimney sweeps when you've got a, a strength of an association like that you you don't really need to look any further you've got a causal mechanism going on there but what they tend to find is an association of, of sort of 10 percent and people still think oh 10 percent that's really low so if there's 100 people here then there'll be 110 people there it's like no not necessarily what it could be is that in the group that were eating whole grains there might have been one incident in 10,000 people and in the group that weren't eating whole grains there might have been 1.1 incident in 10,000 people now 1.1 to 1 is a 10 percent difference but if I say to you, do you care about the difference between one in 10,000 and 1.1 in 10,000? You're going to, of course, say no. Um, but it, there's more to it even than that. So when you look at the whole grain person, what they're trying to imply is, oh, because this person eats whole grains, that's why they had 10% reduced risk of heart disease or cancer or whatever they claim. But it's almost certainly the other way around, because when you look at that person that consumes more whole grains, they're also more affluent um, and they're more educated. You know, have in your mind right now the person who eats quinoa and Jerusalem artichokes and pine nuts and cashew nuts and flaxseed. You know, it's an affluent, educated, slim um, person who exercises. Um, and then think of the person who's living on McDonald's because it's a good value for money. You know, it's cheap. You can get a lot of calories for not very much. And they're having burgers and buns and fries and milkshakes and fizzy drink. I mean, they are completely different people. And what they want you to believe is all oh, that the reason that person is healthier in all of those different ways is just because they eat whole grains. It's like, really, they are a completely and utterly different person. They're in a different income bracket. They're in a different affluence. They have different healthcare programs, different, just different everything. Um, they happen to eat whole grains. So, you know, I would say the whole grains is a marker of that person. It's not a maker of the health of that person. And that's a really significant difference. So epidemiology is just such a weak level of evidence. Yeah. Um, and yet it's all that's been churned out by, you know, the Harvard factory of epidemiological studies. Almost every week they churn one out saying, oh, whole grains are great and red meat is going to kill you. And it's just like, stop it already. I'm done with it all. Ugh. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 I find that so fascinating because um, even when I was in medical school, we talked about epidemiology quite a bit. I had an entire one or two or three courses in it. And we didn't really focus on how weak that data was. It was kind of preached as gospel. And it's really a starting point. The way I look at it is those studies give us a starting point to what we should really investigate in a further trial, like a randomized controlled trial, for example, that's a much higher level evidence where you can actually test the true hypothesis rather than just looking at this data and going, well, this could be related and then let's go test it. But instead of saying, let's go test it, they say, no, this is it. This is not only related, it's causal, which is a big leap. And I agree with you 110% when you say that, you know, the, that 10% difference in an association or whatnot is so darn low, you should not be making any such claims of causation, which all too often happens, <laughs> way yeah. too often. Yeah. Um, and you're and, right that and, one, one should lead to the other. So that you, you're absolutely right. It's such an important point there that epidemiology is supposed to be the start that you make an observed association and then you go and test it. So what you then should do is a massive randomized control trial where you say, right, you lot add whole grains to your diet and you lot don't really do anything. And they did this kind of stuff. I mean, they did that with the Women's Health Initiative and of course found nothing. That was seriously <laughs> inconvenient after eight years or yeah. so. Actually, this amazing low fat diet has you know no impact whatsoever. What a waste of a few hundred thousand pounds that was. So no wonder they don't test it again, because, you know, I can guarantee if they take a randomized control trial and say, you lot eat red meat and you lot carry on eating, you know, the low fat 
um, high carbohydrate standard American diet that the meat guys are going to do better. Um, and that's something they don't want ever to get proven. So they won't do it. They just carry on telling us to eat what they've been telling us to eat since 1980. Yeah, well, you've brought up two interesting concepts right there. One is the, um, the negative studies. It's so often that these negative studies don't really get the fanfare, the press, the people just don't hear about them. And in fact, I think both you and of course, Nina in your work, I think have uncovered some of these negative studies that many people didn't have any idea about because they were almost hidden mm -hmm. to some degree. And so, you know, it, it sort of pains me as a physician, as, you know, a specialist to, to, to think that that would actually happen. Like all, all, all data should be published. And I, I really hate the concept that a lot of journals even out there, they won't publish negative studies. Maybe they do now more than they used to, but I know for many, many years, they wouldn't even publish a negative study because they felt like people didn't want to hear that, you know, yeah. and or those even, can be the most powerful. Yeah. Or even within a study. So if you look at the Cochrane reviews, which is supposed to be the gold standard on dietary fat and saturated fat and the impact on mortality and cardiovascular disease and all that kind of thing. So I forget even which one. There's one claim that they can make, and it's something like there's an association between saturated fat and cardiovascular disease events or something like that. You don't hold me to that. If you go on my website, zoeharkham.com, put in saturated fat, there's a couple of sort of definitive articles on it. But in that Cochrane study, when all they trumpet is this one finding, you go to all the meta-analyses, all the forest plots, and it's like, okay, so... There was no finding there. So, you know, let's say there'll be no finding between total um, mortality and total fat. There'll be no finding between total mortality and saturated fat. There'll be no finding between cardiovascular mortality and saturated fat, or coronary heart disease mortality and saturated fat. And you just go through all, and I remember listing them all out. So none, 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 none. And it's about 13. And one of them they find this, you know, 10%, which is still tiny and not causation and complete nonsense. And then they don't, you know, the abstract should say, the majority of what we found was nothing. Most of what we find was non findings, which means you don't need to worry about it. We didn't find anything. And we went looking. So there isn't anything so stop worrying about it. But they don't report non findings. And non findings for me are just as important as findings. Um, particularly because they tell you what you don't need to worry about, but they don't want to tell you what you don't need to worry about because they still want us to worry about it. Um, just, it's really disingenuous. I mean, it's lying. I'm sorry, let's just call it what it is. Disingenuous is a, a polite academic word, but lying is, is what people know it as. Yeah, I, you're absolutely right. And I, I found that to be problematic uh, over the years. And it, it, from, from, you know, where we come from a professional standpoint, it's really embarrassing. I find it embarrassing that we so often don't report these non-findings or these negative studies, or even some go to the extreme to hide them. I think, you know, you and Nina have done such a great job over the years to kind of try to expose some of this stuff. And, and I think she'll even say it. I think she originally wanted to call her book, The Big Fat Lie, but she changed her mind because maybe she thought it would ruffle too many feathers or something. But it, it, it is exactly what you said. It's not only disingenuous, it's just a flat out lie. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's sad because we are in the mix. The people are in the mix and we are suffering from what you said at the outset of this, of this interview is that 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we were much more healthy than we were now as not only a nation, a, a world, but, but now, you know, our, I'll speak to the U S our rates of being overweight are two out of three people, two thirds, even more, nearly 50% obese. I mean, our numbers are climbing at a more rapid pace than they ever have in history. And it's with these very guidelines that we're speaking of, they haven't helped us at all. In fact, they've made things much, much worse. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. No, it sure is. One of the, one of the things that you, you've talked about a lot over the years is the issue of red meat. And I think this is something that also there's a lot of data that exists. Much of it is just epidemiological, you know, associational data. And I think you've dug pretty deep on this topic. Maybe help us to understand what, what does the real data show when we look at all of what we have in conglomerate? What, what's the deal with red meat? 
I mean, the first thing with red meat, and I think it was um, a surgeon captain uh, over a hundred years ago, Thomas Peter Cleave, I think his name was, who just said for an ancient food to be responsible for a modern illness is quite the most absurd thing I've ever heard. Um, so I always kind of go back to that top level principle of it makes no sense for the animal foods that we we evolved to eat. You know, we kind of went from Neanderthal to rocket scientist, um, literally during the Ice Age period when we probably had access to zero plants. Um, but we would have eaten any animals that we could have got gotten hold of, whether on the land or from the seas. Um, and that's the time of, of, you know, humankind's greatest evolution, greatest developments. It just makes no sense. I mean, how anyone can get away with uh, convincing people that meat is bad for you. And then that thing that's in a box with all the nice bright colouring on and that gets advertised on the television and has about 60 ingredients and reads like a chemistry set, you know, that's good for you. And this red meat is bad for you. I mean, how, how do you get away with that? How... How good at propaganda do you have to be to convince people that, that meat is the problem? It just staggers me on a daily basis. Um, so they've not done randomized control trials on meat. So the early randomized control trials that were done, the ones that I looked at for my PhD, were very much on fat rather than meat. Because at that time, meat just meat wasn't in the frame. It wasn't considered to be an issue. It was just this notion developed by the pathologists and then Ansel Keys that somehow fat was bad for you and if it wasn't total fat then maybe it was saturated fat you know those ideas were just forming um so they didn't they didn't change the meat really in the diets of of those people it would more be that they'd say okay don't have butter but do have margarine um swap out eggs and have this sort of egg substitute with different kind of fat in instead those were the trials that were being done so there are practically no trials out there that say, right, this group is going to eat red meat and this group isn't. You get things like the Seventh Day Adventist work or the stuff that comes out of Loma Linda University, which is very conflicted. It's very much a vegetarian orientated institution. And of course, it's, you know, the Adventist um, part of the religion is that vegetarianism, if not veganism, is favoured rather than meat eating. Um, so they will put out these studies saying, oh, let's look at the average population and let's, then let's look at our Seventh-day Adventists and oh, they're healthy and that must be because of the vegetarian diet. It's like, no, they don't smoke, they don't drink. Um, they have purpose in life. You know, it's well known that having um, faith um, and something that you believe in gives people a purpose in life and that people tend to be less stressed and more fulfilled and it tends to have psychological benefits. Um, they have a sense of community because they very much are not just following a religion, they're part of a community in a local area. Um, there are so many other benefits that go with that lifestyle that you can't just claim it's the vegetarianism. And then even when you look at some of their studies and you look at their definitions of vegetarianism, they'll say, oh, we eat meat occasionally, maybe sort of, you know, once a month and fish maybe two or three times a week. It's like, that's not vegetarian. That's kind of healthy eating. That's, um, you know, what a lot of people will do. Certainly you should be including fish in your diet. Um, so there just aren't red meat studies. Um, and then when they do the epidemiological studies where they say, oh, red meat is really bad for you, a lot of those are done on US data. And the US counts the burger, the probably the, well, not probably, it is the most commonly consumed red meat in the US. They count that as red meat, not processed red meat. Now, to me, it doesn't matter how good your McDonald's burger is, it's still processed red meat. And what they then don't adjust for in these studies, and this is the other thing, if you don't adjust properly in these studies, then you've got complete nonsense. So they might adjust for things like, oh, do the people smoke or do they drink or do they do exercise or their BMI? They hardly ever adjust for other foods. So what do you eat with processed red meat called a burger? You eat a burger bun and you eat ketchup and you eat fries cooked in vegetable oil and you probably have a fizzy drink or a milkshake or an ice cream. And you are that type of person that we described earlier on. But no, let's just blame it on the processed meat and call it red meat. Um, and then damn the whole of red meat in all of that. You know, do a proper study where you've got the Sean Bakers of this world or the Joel Salatans or the people eating um, pasture fed, properly raised red meat versus people eating, again, the typical standard diet or 
um, burger processed meat with with buns and fries or whatever, and you would have a very very different picture. But of course, they they won't do that study. Yeah, no, that's. I think you mentioned a couple of really important things in science. The first uh, uh, scenario you gave about Loma Linda, there are so many confounders there, so many other things that are happening that would affect you know that overall outcome that the folks that live there tend to be more healthy than the average person. Well, they have so many other reasons to be more healthy. And I couldn't agree more. And that's the whole thing that the blue zones, I think for me really brought up, it wasn't so much the diet per se, except that most of those blue zone areas ate real food. The, The amount of processed foods that they were eating was much lower than the average. But in addition to that, just like you mentioned, they have this sense of community and the people are active in whatever it is, their belief, their religion, their culture, their, uh, <clears throat> you know, whatever that was for them, but they, they had all these other things going for them that also, you know, contributed to their extreme health and longevity. It wasn't just one thing. And I think you're absolutely right when you pick out the folks uh, that are pr- promoting this vegetarian diet in Loma Linda, which isn't even truly a vegetarian diet, because of course they have meat in there with fish and this and that. So it's, it's kind of bizarre to even call it that, but, but they do call it that. <laughs> and so there's so many confounding things. And then when they go to demonize red meat, like you said, appropriately, there really isn't any good data to demonize it with. It's all these other associational things that are epidemiologic, where they take the one person who eats the red meat, which is a processed you know, burger at McDonald's with French fries, with the, of course, soda that all of these things are highly full of sugars and processed sugars and all that. And the seed oils you mentioned, of course. So the data is just not there. So I appreciate that you, and you've looked, I know this is part of your big work as your PhD. You've looked at all this and there's not much, if any data to support that red meat is bad for you. Do you like hackers? I certainly don't. I hate them. I just can't stand even the thought of being hacked at the airport or any other place where you use public Wi-Fi. And so I have joined ExpressVPN and you should too. And if you use my code at expressvpn.com forward slash Dr. Thomas, that's D-R-T-H-O-M-A-S, you will get three months for free. So why stress about the hackers? Why stress about using airport Wi-Fi? I don't. I don't any longer. In fact, I use airport Wi-Fi all the time because I'm protected at ExpressVPN. So check it out. ExpressVPN.com forward slash Dr. Thomas for three months free. And so I I, I I probably should have said I was vegetarian for 20 years. Yeah, I was so hoping if, you'd yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, if, 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 I, if I was going in with any bias, it was defined against red meat. So, you know, I really do like to think I'm an honest researcher and I report as I find. Um, and, you know, if a study is done and I know some of the authors and I've met them and spoken with them at conferences or whatever, if I still think that there's a flaw in it or I don't agree with a certain bit, then, uh, you know, in in my reports, they tend to be very factual. Um, You know, the study did this, and this is what it did wrong. And here's an error here. Um, But I'll say, you know, if I'm expressing an opinion at any time, it will be in my view, but I will, you know, I I will sort of critique and I've been um, critical to an extent of a sort of low carb, high fat, because I work um, a lot, you know, I'm still fascinated by obesity. And I think, for example, when the low carb, high fat community have been saying, oh, you know, add butter to your meat and, you know, butter makes your pants fall down kind of thing. You're going to lose so much weight eating butter, you know, you're not going to know yourself. It's just not helpful. Um, so I'm really prepared to critique where I don't find something being um, being helpful to people trying to get healthy eating advice. Um, but, you know, if I, if I had a bias, it was towards vegetarianism. But Meat is so nutritious. You know, the single most nutritious food I've ever found on the planet is liver. Um, you know, yeah. I say to people, if, if you want to enter a nutrient contest and you want to win, pick liver, because it doesn't matter what the other person picks, you're going to win on complete protein, essential fats, vitamins and minerals. On the whole profile, you're going to win. You know, oily fish would be better on the essential fats and, um, you know, there might be something else, but on individual things, but on the whole complete package, liver is, is going to win. Um, and yeah, and p- people telling you, no, whole grains are great. They're not. They're just not. Yeah. I, I, I was just curious, is it uh, easy or hard to uh, 
get liver where you are in Wales and in that area? Is it hard to find? How do you, where do you, easy. Is, is it available? It's re really oh, it's easy. easy, yeah. We, we live in the middle of nowhere. We live in the countryside. Um, okay. I know my butcher, I know my fishmonger, we grow vegetables. Um, if we need to supplement them, we know where to get other homegrown vegetables from. We know people who've got chickens, we know where the eggs come from, we know where our dairy comes from. We're really fortunate um, that we can source really good quality proper food. Um, but if I want to go into the butcher and I want anything, I want um, ox heart, um, any offal, kidneys, liver, um, if you want a dog for the bone, if you want marrow bone for a particular dish, no problem. Wow. That's, yeah. uh, that's where I want to be. I want to be <laughs> able to source all those as easily as you. That's amazing because that, that is a little bit of an issue for a lot of us that just go to whatever local supermarket is. A lot of these types of foods like the organ meats, for example, aren't as readily available. I, I feel like they might've been previously. I know when I grew up, my mother used to cook liver and I'll be honest, I didn't love the preparation or maybe, I don't know, we ate it not often, maybe once every couple of weeks or something, which is actually a good, you don't need to eat liver yeah. every day. In fact, if yeah. you do, that's probably too much. This yeah. should be something that's every week or, yeah. you know, you don't eat large quantities of it, but it is super nutrient dense, like you mentioned. And I, what, what I loved about what you just said is not just about, you know, how easy it is for you to get liver and these things, but everything you mentioned was real food. It was well sourced, you were familiar with where your eggs came from, where your chicken, where your beef were, you know, you knew either the folks that raised them, you know, where the, where the, where the eggs came from, what pasture the, the hens were grazing on. I mean, you're familiar and that, that is so important to know the source and the quality of our food. And many of us can't get that information easily. And if we can't, we do our best, right? In my humble opinion, it's always better, Do even best. if it's not the best raised, whatever, if it's a real food product, you can recognize it. It doesn't have to have any kind of label because you know what it is. There's not 50 ingredients. That's always going to trump whatever processed food or fake meat or fake eggs or whatever it is that's available that has 50 ingredients that looks like the science lab kit that you mentioned <laughs> earlier. And so I, I don't want people to be you know, um, discouraged if they can't find a locally raised, you know, um, meat source or local pasture raised eggs. Don't be discouraged. It's always going to be better to buy those whole foods mm -hmm. than to buy the highly processed ones, even if they aren't the absolute best, you know, raised, um, you know, uh, process, uh, excuse me, best raised foods like uh, pasture raised eggs and, you know, the, the grass fed and finished beef. It's always going to be better to eat the whole food. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you for no. that. I'm so glad. But you know, it's quite oh. handy because we're out for supper tonight with some friends and our butcher knows us so well. So I just say, right, so I need a steak for me, steak for Andy. He knows what I'll prefer. And, and even down to the size. So then Ash starts cutting them. It's like, okay, so 200 grams for Zoe, 300 grams for Andy. Steve wants a rump that's about an inch thick. And Gilbert likes, um, what's Gilbert on? Gilbert's on ribeye. Monty's on sirloin, Sean wants to fill it, and, the, and he knows all the sizes that we want. So I just say, right, we're seeing the usual crowd tonight, you know, six steaks, please. And he just he just knows, and you can't beat that. Um, and being prepared to pay, I know times are really tough. I mean, I don't know what they're like in the, in the US, but in the UK at the moment, this, you know, energy stuff you're hearing about is horrific, and inflation is, you know, running rampant and all the rest of it. But it's kind of, it, it's still so important what you can afford. So I get milk from a farm. I don't get milk from the supermarket. And I know that what I'm paying is then, you know, £1.20 a litre instead of, I could probably get it in the supermarket. Some supermarkets will make it a loss leader. So they'll try and get you in the door by selling it at a loss, but then that's not helping the farmer. And they're going out of business. So in the long run, if I want milk, and it's one of my favourite foods, most of my calories come from dairy, I need the dairy farmers to get a good price for their things. So I need to go direct to the farm, cut out the supermarket. Um, and it's just that's my personal choice. So I know people who would rather have a Netflix subscription or the latest iPhone. You know, my iPhone is is rubbish. It's 100 years old and I don't have Netflix and I don't have a TV license and I don't eat out that often. And I don't you know, there's lots of things I don't do. But for me, what I spend on food is a real priority. That's as, as important as it gets. I find that so fascinating what you said. And one of the things that I often share is that, and, and we all sort of intuitively agree with this, that we can't put a price on health and you can't 
sort of buy good health. Although you can buy good quality food, which can contribute to your overall health because I've never, as a physician, I've never once, not even one time had somebody complained to me that their health was just too good. Like, oh doc, I'm so <laughs> upset. My health is so good. I can wake up in the morning. I can do anything I want. I have nothing that keeps me back because I'm so healthy. Nobody has ever told me that, but I've, yeah. I've heard the opposite of that yeah. daily. Yeah. You know, I can't do this. I can't do that. I wake up and I have no energy and I feel like crap and my joints hurt. And, and much of that can be attributed directly to what ends up first in, in our cart at the supermarket and then at the tip of our fork. We can't yeah. escape that. It's, it's just one of those things that is so important. <laughs> and maybe you can speak to, because for me, it's not only that. It's never one thing. It's a really important thing. Diet is super, super important. Exercise, of course, is very, very important. They should not exist without one another. I know you've done some looking at exercise and how much do we actually need and a little bit you know, kind of deeper into what science exists. Maybe you could speak a little bit to the exercise piece and, and maybe this whole caloric, you know, do we have to operate at a caloric deficit? Do we, what does that look like? I know you've looked at it, you know, really deeply. You can, you can give us the, the short version, but yeah. feel free to, I'd love to hear your view on that. Yeah. I mean, short version is exercise is good for everything other than weight. Um, so when people say you love need it. to eat less and do more, you just don't. I mean, I've written entire books on this. It, it drives you down really bad choice pathways. Um, and if you try to eat less and do more, your body is just going to try to get you to eat more and do less um, because it will not tolerate hunger. It will not tolerate an en energy deficit. We have evolved to close an energy deficit as, as far as we possibly can and indeed to store as much energy as we possibly can. So the only way to lose weight is to actually work with your body, which is to eat better not to eat less and to stop eating the processed food that you're going to overeat because you're going to become addicted to it. You know, you're not going to become addicted to red meat and green beans or salmon and, and you know, kale or something. You're just not. So you've got to eat better if you want to lose weight. But then exercise is it's just good for everything else. You know, it's good for your muscles. It's good for your mood. It's good for your mind. It's good for your heart. It's good for your mobility. It's good to avoid sarcopenia as you age. Um, it, it's, you know, and, and when I talk about exercise, it's about doing, you know, all the bits of exercise. So it's about doing strength stuff. It's about doing stamina stuff and it's about doing suppleness, um, and, and having a range of those. So it might be doing some weights at home. It might be going for a brisk walk in the morning and it might be doing something like yoga or Pilates. Um, but you know, watching my, my mother, you know, my father sadly passed away during, um, lockdown, but watching my mother. As she's got older and she was incredibly sporty she was actually a sports teacher um, and did sport at a very very high level during her life um, but then didn't keep up kind of the the suppleness and the strength as much as the sort of stamina um, and so over time you know she finds it more difficult to get up out of a chair um, and just you know little things like you know making sure you can always push up and if you've gone on the floor you know imagine you've broken one arm and could you actually then get up just using that we need to practice all of all of that kind of stuff so it's it's what I would call functional fitness making sure that you can continue to be mobile and active and independent for as long as you're still here not not to have any part of your life when you're not mobile or you're not um, independent and, and, and that, not saying, you know, being in a wheelchair is bad because look at wheelchair athletes, um, you know, it's not about ability or disability. It's about within your range of what you're able to do, maintaining that for as long as you possibly can. Um, so I think, I mean, exercise is, is so important. We don't always feel like doing it. I walk every day. It rains a hell of a lot where I live. Um, you know, I say it rains 200 days at least. <laughs> Um, and in the winter when it's, you know, I, I, we only know it in Celsius, so five degrees or something, and it's practically sleet. The last thing you want to do is to go for a half an hour walk around the hills locally to get your heart raised, but you just put your coat on and you just do it every morning without even, if you asked yourself, do I want to do this? The answer is going to be no. So don't, don't, <laughs> don't get into that, that negotiation. Just, you know, have your pint of cappuccino, get your coat on, get out the door before you've even thought about it. Um, but don't try to do more because it's going to make you lose weight because it's not. If you do more, you're just going to want to eat more or do less of other things. There's some great re research on that. Actually, that's very interesting as well. Yeah, that is so fascinating. And it reminds me of a couple of things. One, 
I, I took my kids to Disneyland a few years ago and I saw a guy with a shirt that had um, a raccoon that was deadlifting, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And, and it said, I work out so I can eat garbage. And that is like the worst thing that we could be telling ourselves. And I think that's the reason that you and I, when we look out the window now, we see people, you know, either walking or biking or running. And we didn't see that as kids because now we're in this place where the obesity rates are skyrocketing. And we think erroneously that if we just move more, that's going to change everything. And, yeah. and you, you can speak to the numbers that, and that you so eloquently stated it right there. It's, it's not going to help with the weight loss so much. It's so good for everything else. The benefits of exercise, there's more than 100 of them. There's so many, dozens and dozens and dozens. And, and weight loss is not really one of them. It's really, really hard, actually, just like you've said, to lose weight with exercise. Yeah. Because if you don't adjust the other things, like what's on your plate, yeah. you're going to be just chasing you know, your proverbial tail, as it were. <laughs> Here's, so the other really, here's the other really important thing about exercise and weight as well. I know people that you've just described where they exercise and, and in some cases a crazy amount. You know, they're as addicted to exercise as they are to carbohydrates, quite frankly. And then, of course, they use carbohydrates to fuel that exercise. So I often sort of think if you if you control your weight with what goes in your mouth, which is how you should control your weight, there is no reason on earth why you should not stay slim. But if you try to control your weight through what you do, then God help you if you get injured or ill, because you have lost your mechanism, your personal mechanism, which actually doesn't really work that well at all. Um, and you'll see people and you haven't seen them for a while and they've gained 20 pounds and you kind of don't want to say anything, but they, they want to tell you because they're feeling quite embarrassed about the fact that you can clearly see that they've gained 20 pounds and they're like oh you know i had a, an injury i had an achilles heel injury and i couldn't run anymore it's like yes yeah, so then change what goes in not what you're doing but you kind of know if, if you can if you're in if you're at your own master of your eating you're always going to be fine if you're relying on running a marathon every two or three days you're just not going to be able to keep that up yeah yeah, no, so, so true. And I, uh, so, so beautiful. What I think what you said just a few minutes ago too, about just eat better, mm -hmm. right? It's not about this calories in calories out thing. It's, it's a, it doesn't pan out because we, as you know, we are not a chemistry lab in the way that Atwater and those that established these things over a hundred years ago. And it really hasn't changed much with respect to the science, which for me is really sad because we could do better. You know, yeah. we've, we've been chasing this calorie thing for more than a hundred years and it's never really worked. And it's embarrassing because it's not an up-to-date way to look at it. Food is more than a calorie. It's information, yeah. it's signaling. It's, there's so many things. I, I interviewed uh, a fitness expert just yesterday, Clark Bartram, and he told me, he, he said, food is the most important drug that exists. It's the most mm -hmm. powerful drug. And we don't even think about it that way because it has so many effects throughout the body. Food is, is not just a calorie. It's information. It could be a drug, a good one or a bad one, depending on the choices that we make. So thank you for making that so simple for us and breaking it down because I, I really don't want people to ever feel like they have to do so many miles or do so many things in the gym, so many minutes on the elliptical, the treadmill, because of the diet thing. Like just change what's on your plate. Start, yeah. start with that. And then exercise because it has so many other amazing benefits. Thank yeah. you for that. So beautiful. <laughs> well, well, Dr. Harkham, we've gone so many amazing places and I want to be respectful of your time. I would love it if you would just, uh, if there's any sort of parting words you want to share and then how can people reach out to you? Okay. I mean, I guess the, the one thing that I haven't had um, shared so far is when people say, what's your summary diet advice? So I, I just have three simple points. Number one is eat real food. Number two is choose that real food for the nutrients that it provides. And if you do that, you will be choosing meat, especially red, fish, especially oily, eggs, especially the yolks, dairy, especially full fat, and then some vegetables and salads um, and so on. And then number three, um, don't eat more than three times a day, really ideally. Um, you know, the whole dietitian advice of breakfast, graze, have a snack, lunch, have another snack, dinner, have another snack. Um, you know, that there's people sometimes putting stuff in their mouth, you know, up to 20 times a day. And you'll know as a doctor what that kicks off physiologically. It's like a whole orchestra 
kicks in, um, you know, these signals and metabolism. Um, and, and we abuse that at our peril. That's why we're developing type 2 diabetes so young, because it's the body's way of saying, look, you've just stuck in too many carbohydrates too often. I'm done. I can't cope with all this insulin, take the glucose out of the bloodstream and all that. I can't do it anymore. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm out. Um, so those would be my my three if somebody says to me how should i eat those would be my three things um and then how do people find me zoeharkham.com i'm on twitter that's about the only one i do really i don't really do instagram or i'm on facebook but i check it about once a year um it's <laughs> my site or twitter basically that's what i'm not so much twitter nowadays either um if i really said what i thought on twitter on some things i think i'd be cancelled right now so um i try to watch how much i'm on there as we know some uh, some good doctors have been cancelled over the last couple of years for daring to suggest yeah. vitamin d might be healthy you know oh, oh gosh my God. yeah how terrible i better not say stuff like that i'll get i'll get thrown off twitter <laughs> <laughs> we well, that's, that's so so key, and and you are very. I, I love your website actually. And for those that don't know it, you do a wonderful job at summarizing the latest literature, the data, the research, and you even have programs on there where people can get all these executive summaries from you, so they don't have to dig deep and read for the hours and hours that you do, and and they can just kind of get the distilled version. So I would encourage everybody to jump on over to your website, zoeharcom.com. We'll have it in the show notes and. And on Twitter, you're there as well. And and those things that you shared, they're they're foundational. Eat real food. I mean, yes, eat real food. Don't <laughs> don't eat the crap processed stuff. Just yeah. eat the real food. And if you can't get it from your local butcher, like Dr. Zoe can, do the best next thing. If you yeah. can get the grass fed and finished, if you can get the wild caught fish, do whatever is the best that you can get in your scenario. But real food is always, always, always going to trump that processed stuff. Always, always. So, and the nutrient, look for the nutrient um, dense ones and, and be, yeah. you know, be uh, cognizant of what you're eating and what nutrients it provides. And the thing that you said about three meals a day, oh my gosh, I, and, and I think many of us were in this boat, right? When we did our training, we were taught we should eat, you know, every couple hours, every two to three mm -hmm. hours. And it's the worst advice that we have been giving people because yeah. you ramp up your insulin, you ramp up you know, this, this whole process of fat storage, you never get into the fat burning. You only yeah. do storage of fat because that's what insulin does. It turns on the fat storage and it's, oh my gosh, 88% of us, as we know, are insulin resistant. And a big part of it is because we never stop eating. We're yeah. always putting things in our mouth, but it's so simple. And I think if you, if we follow you and do real food, you won't be hungry. That's the yeah. cool part is it actually works together. When you eat real food, you're satisfied. Your body's not craving to eat every two to three hours because that, that last bit of glucose or carbs that you had in your processed bar or cereal or whatever that's run out and you're looking for your next one, when you eat real food, that doesn't happen. You're satiated. It's a beautiful thing. And that's the way we were designed as you've so appropriately shared. And oh my gosh, this has been so great. ZoeHarcom.com. Thank, thank you, Dr. Zoe, for being here with us. It's been a true, true pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss out on any future episode. And I'd love to hear your comments and feedback. If there's any topic you'd love to hear about, you're dying to know, burning questions, please comment below and let me know what future topics are of interest to you. Disclaimer, nothing in this video is medical advice. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes only.